Hi, I'm Dr. Brendan Stiles. Um, I'm thrilled that everybody could join us this morning. We have three really great presentations that I think will generate a lively discussion and that really cover all aspects of lung cancer care from diagnosis to late stage treatment. Um, I'm uh, the new chair of the communications committee, so I'm thrilled to take that role on at the ISLC. I'm the chief of the Department of uh, Cardiothoracic and Vascular Surgery at Montefiore Health System, Albert Einstein uh, Cancer Center. Um, I'm also involved in patient advocacy, and I've been chair of the Lung Cancer Research Foundation since 2017. We also have with us Dr. Paul Wheatley Price, a patient advocate who I'll introduce in full a little bit later. And then we have three great panelists. I'm going to introduce all three to give uh, the talks on their presentations from yesterday. I think, uh, I think you'll see that there's lots of great things to talk about, and I hope that we'll have a robust question and answer period. Our first presenter is Dr. John Field. Um, Dr. Field is the Director of Research at the Roy Castle Lung Cancer Research Program and is the Chief Investigator for the UK Lung Cancer Screening Trial. He's the previous chair of the ISLC Screening Prevention and Early Detection Committee, and he formed the ISLC Strategic Screening Advisory Group. Dr. Field is very well known in the field, and I'm looking forward to hearing his thoughts and his presentation. I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Field. Well, thank you very much indeed for the introduction, and I will uh, share my screen. So, <clears throat> This uh, presentation today provides uh, the uh, Lung Cancer Mortality UKLS trial data, which has just been published in Lancet Regional Health Europe, if you wish to go and look at the publication. The UKLS was undertaken by a, a great trial team, and we're extremely grateful to all the individuals who participated in this uh, screening trial. This figure is from the IARC uh, website and it shows the impact of lung cancer worldwide. And it's lung cancer is responsible for more cancer deaths than any other cancer. However, there is good news. And the good news is that if the disease is identified at an early stage, and if the patient is suitable for a surgical intervention, there's a very good outcome. And the ISLAC staging uh, publication of 2015 identifies an excellent outcome for the stage 1A patients. This figure actually comes from our uh, Nature Reviews in Lung Cancer, uh, in Nature Reviews in Cancer uh, publication. And actually, I'm sorry, I'm trying to go back a slide. Well, well okay, this is the, um, sorry, we're, we're out of sync here. This actually provides an overview of, of all lung cancer uh, screening randomized controlled trials, many of which you will be aware of. The NLST and the Nelson trials provide conclusive evidence that intervention reduces lung cancer mortality. And you can see the detail of each of the trials in there if you wish to uh, go into them. This figure provides a flow chart of the UKLS trial recruitment. So UKLS trial compared low dose CT with usual care, utilizing the Liverpool Lung Project version to lung cancer risk prediction model to select high risk participants. And this model has been validated and calibrated in our recent Thorax publication. Just going to point out, this is a UKLS walled single screen design trial, and it resulted in the diagnosis of lung cancer in with 67% at stage one and 83% were suitable for sur surgical intervention. And it also allows us to demonstrate the continued benefits of lung cancer screening beyond the initial screen. So the <clears throat> primary outcome of this publication was mortality due to lung cancer. Secondary outcomes investigated were mortality from all causes and from all cancers and causes other than lung cancer. It is recognized that the UKLS pilot study was not powered for a reduction in lung cancer mortality. And thus in this, pub, in this presentation, also in the publication in Lancet, we've undertaken a meta-analysis, including randomized trials published to the 2nd of November, 2020, with at least three years median follow-up. In this slide, we present the cumulative mortality of lung cancer in the UKLS trial, 
with a total of 76 lung cancer recorded deaths, 30 in the screening arm and 46 in the control arm. The primary analysis show that this difference was not statistically significant with an RR of 0 0.65. However, I want to particularly bring to your attention that there is a benefit in terms of lung cancer mortality with the difference seen most strongly in years three to six after randomization and continuing for seven years follow-up period. We've also investigated the cumulative mortality from all causes in the participants diagnosed with lung cancer. There were 161 participants diagnosed with lung cancer and a total of 100 individuals died from any cause. The number of deaths among participants in the screening arm was significantly lower than in the control arm with 42 compared to 58. This difference was seen in males, but not in females. We've analyzed the results of the nine randomized controlled trials which were included in the meta-analysis. Now, if you're interested, the details of the selection criteria for the randomized controlled trials that were included in this meta-analysis is described in detail in our recent Lancet Regional Health Europe publication. So the trials included the French Dante, the Danish DLCST, the Italian trials, mild and ital lung, the German Luce, and the USA LSS trial. And naturally both the NLST and Nelson trials were included. And this is the first meta-analysis, which also includes the UKLS trial data. Basically, the results of this meta-analysis associated with a 16% relative reduction in lung cancer mortality when compared against a non-low-dose CT control arm with no significant heterogeneity. And to follow precedent and to demonstrate even-handedness, the meta-analysis used the most recent primary reported mortality results from the randomized trials. Thus, it has to be noted that this result is conservative as the most recent reported results include deaths from lung cancer diagnosed after the screening phase of the trials when bro both groups receive usual care. This does not actually affect the absolute benefit, but it does dilute the relative effect of the intervention. And this meta-analysis includes data from 94,834 individuals across the nine RCTs. And it does indicate a small reduction in all-cause mortality with an RR of 0 0.97. However, even this is a small reduction it represents a large number of lives saved. So in summary, the UKLS trial has seven years follow-up outcome data, providing lung cancer mortality results, which while not statistically significant, is consistent with the findings from other trials of a substantial reduction in lung cancer mortality. And the uniqueness of the UKLS is that it was the only lung cancer RCT to use a risk prediction model to select high-risk participants. As I said before, the LLP version two. And it's previously reported in the Nelson, NLST and Lewis trials that there was a potential difference in the effectiveness of screening between males and females. This was not seen in the UKLS. So the meta-analysis provides further support for lung cancer screening by low dose chest CT. However, implementation research must continue to be pursued as presented in this diagram called Spiral. It's a figure from our nature reviews in clinical oncology. And you can see we've listed population recruitment, nodule management, screening frequency, sex differences, cost effectiveness. And all of these are important for us to continue to develop. So we still have a great deal to learn and there'll be valuable contributions from a number of ongoing programs. The one in the UK is the NHS England Targeted Health Check and there's a Horizon 2020 project called Four in Lung Run. Thank you. 
that sounds great, Dr. Field. Thank you so much for sharing all that. Um, I hope the press will appreciate the significance of this along with the joint publication and, and the uniqueness of this trial, but also the, the power of this meta-analysis that Dr. Field and his group have done. I mean, we'll get to questions about those at the end. I'd now like to move on to our next presenter, um, who's Dr. Atoka Romero. She's the head of the Liquid Biopsy Laboratory from the Medical Oncology Department at the Hospital Universitario Puerta de Hierro in Madrid, Spain, since 2015. Her major clinical interests and research interests are focused on the field of biomarker discovery and non-invasive biomarker testing. Dr. Romero is going to talk um, a bit about the Spanish Nadim trial. This is a groundbreaking trial in neoadjuvant therapy, neoadjuvant immunotherapy for lung cancer patients, one that we've heard about several times at the World Lung. And this is a unique twist and update on a, a potential predictor in this trial. So Dr. Romero, I'll turn it over to you. I'm excited to hear the, the, the data. Thank you very much for your presentation and thank you very much for your interest in uh, the results from, uh, from the team trial, the CTDNA analysis. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Okay. So again, thank you very much for your interest in our work. Uh, here I'm presenting the results uh, regarding cdDNA analysis in Nadine clinical trial. I am presenting the results of the analysis in the pretreatment uh, plasma sample. So as you may recall, um, in Nadine clinical trial, I'm going to mute this over here. Uh, in Nadine clinical trial, uh, um, patients with non-small cell lung cancer with a stage 3A, uh, which were um, uh, diagnosed as having resectable tumor by a multidisciplinary team were eligible. Patients had to be um, treatment naive and tumor had to be negative for EGFR and ALT mutations, uh, ALT applications. Um, as you may know, patients receive three cycles of neoadjuvant, uh, nivolumab plus uh, chemotherapy, and then after surgery, patients had uh, one-year treatment with adjuvant nivolumab. The intention to treat population was 46 patients. Uh, primary endpoint was already published in Lancet Oncology with about 24-month progress progression-free survival. And secondary endpoints include three years overall survival, um, toxicity, and biomarker analysis. So um, PFS and OS is going to be presented um, today by Professor Provencio. Um, so PFS in the intention to treat, uh, treat population and three years PFS is, is 70%. And uh, OS is 80%, uh, three years OS is 80%. And 91% in the per protocol populations. These are um, restricted to patients that receive uh, adjuvant therapy. So uh, we also perform a biomarker analysis in the Nadine samples in order to um, explore the predictive value or, pro or prognostic value of different biomarkers. Uh, we analyze the standard biomarkers such as PDL1 and TMB. And we found that neither PDL1 uh, nor TMB were predictive for, uh, for long term overall survival. So we used uh, for TMB the um, thermohistal panel. And as you can see, we evaluate different cutoff. For PDL1, we evaluate a cutoff of 1% or 50%. And also TMB, we evaluate different cutoff, 7, 10, and um, some other. Um, we did not find any. Uh, significant association between any of these biomarkers and um, long-term survival. We also analyzed circulating tumor DNA for treatment levels of circulating tumor DNA. Uh, for this analysis, we used the oncomine pan-cancer circulating free DNA assay, and we had a viable 43 uh, samples where um, had the uh, optimal conditions for uh, circulating tumor DNA analysis. And using this panel, we detect uh, circulating tumor DNA in 70%, uh, almost 70% uh, of the pretreatment plasma samples. And we found an average of two mutations uh, per sample. So uh, since there is no standardized way to measure the amount of circulating tumor DNA in blood, 
uh, we um, thought that the sum of all uh, uh, mutations, the sum of allele frequencies from all detected mutations will be the most appropriate approach. And we use a cutoff of 1%. So um, patients with low cDNA um, uh, levels in the pretreatment plasma samples, less than 1%, had significantly improved um, survival in terms of PTS with a hazard rate of 0.22 and significantly improved uh, overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0.04. Um, in contrast, uh, clinical response assessed by, um, by CTS scans and according to RESIST criteria were not predictive for uh, PTS and OS and you can see P values of 0 0.9 uh, and 0 0.9 for PPS and OS. We also um, uh, calculated the C statistic, with which uh, this statistic gave us an idea of uh, how good uh, prognostic factor can discriminate between patients who uh, have this disease and a patient who have been diagnosed as having progression disease and patients who have not. And the higher C statistic, the higher capacity to discriminate between the opposite situations. So this is the C statistic for um, circulating tumor DNA, which was higher than the C statistic yield by um, uh, tumor response assessments according to resist criteria. This is for PCS and regarding OS, the difference was even higher. Uh, with 0 0.85 as uh, a statistic for circulating tumor DNA and 0 0.68 for uh, resist criteria. Uh, we also evaluate circulating tumor DNA uh, by using other approaches. So when using a cutoff of 2%, we obtain a similar results uh, when using 2% in in instead of 1%. And also, uh, some other researchers have stipulated that uh, have measured circulating tumor DNA in blood by only taking into account the mutation that is detected at, at the highest allele frequency. And using this approach and with a cutoff of 1%, we also uh, see that circulating tumor DNA levels in the pretreatment plasma samples uh, identify the, or is, are this, um, a fact, prognostic factor is associated with uh, PCS and OS, and these are the hazard ratio and p values for these different uh, approaches. So, here you can see the Kaplan Mayer curves according to uh, CTS scans and based on RISIS criteria. And as you can see, uh, this is the Kaplan Mayer curve for PCS, and this is the Kaplan Mayer curve for OS. And as you can see, the curves do not separate that nicely uh, as here. Uh, here I am presenting the kaplan mayer curve for um, PPS and OS according to pretreatment circulating tumor DNA levels. And as you can see, um, the circulating tumor DNA pretreatment levels identify a uh, group of patients with different uh, prognosis. So basically, these are my uh, conclusions. Uh, neither TMB nor PDL1 were predictive for long term survival in a DIN clinical trial. And pre treatment circulating tumor DNA analysis can identify patients uh, at high risk of progressions and outperform radi radiological responses, as I said, according to resist criteria in the predictions of long term survival. So, thank you very much for your interest again in our uh, research. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Romero. That was also a very compelling presentation. I hope the press realizes sort of the two paradigms that this is really addressing, the move of these drugs into earlier stage disease and the idea to find predictors, predictors of who should get the drug, predictors of response. And I hope that there'll be questions and please put them in the chat um, if you have time or you can save them to the end. Um, our last presenter is Dr. Shikichi Takamori. Um, Dr. Takamori is a pulmonary physician in the Department of Thoracic Oncology, the National Hospital Organization Kyushu Cancer Center in Japan. Raised part of a multidisciplinary team providing surgical therapy, chemotherapy, 
and radiation therapy, focusing on thoracic malignant tumors, such as lung cancer, metastatic lung cancer, mediastinal tumors, and pleural mesothelioma. And he's gonna talk about a really important topic. I mean, we've heard and you hear through World Lung constantly about all this progress we're making. And the question is, you know, are the narrow confines of clinical trials applicable to patient populations as a whole? You know, should we have broader enrollment criteria? Should we be given elderly patients these types of, of drugs and the breakthroughs that we're seeing? And so Dr. Takamori, I'll turn it over to you to start to address some of those questions. Thank you very much for giving such a valuable opportunity. I am Shinkish Takamori from National Hospital Organization, Kyushu Cancer Center in Japan. Today, I'll be talking about survival benefit from amino checkpoint inhibitors in stage four non-small cell lung cancer patients over 75 years old of age. Recently, amino checkpoint inhibitors have become one of the standard therapies in non-small cell lung cancer. However, Elderly patients with non-small cell lung cancer are likely to be excluded from clinical trials due to the lower functional capacity. The aim of this study is to analyze whether elderly lung cancer patients will really benefit from amino checkpoint inhibitors using real-world data. This slide summarizes the age-associated changes in immunology. There are three main blood immune cells, namely neutrophils, macrophages, and dendritic cells. Although the number of neutrophils and macrophages does not change with age, the chemotaxis, uh, which means the movement in response to a chemical stimuli, decreases with age. In addition, cytokines, including interferon gamma from macrophages and dendritic cells, decreases, resulting in impaired anti in presentation. These changes can be summarized as three points. First, decreased function of neutrophils, macrophage. Second, decreased antigen presentation by dendritic cells. Third, reduced chemotaxis by lymphocytes. These three factors may impair the cancer immunity cycle. This age-dependent Immune dysfunction is collectively called immunosenescence. This raises the clinical question whether elderly patients will really benefit from immune checkpoint inhibitors. Let's look at the immunology in elderly patients from a different perspective. This slide shows the percentages of lung cancer patients included in clinical trials and those who were newly diagnosed as lung cancer. The blue bar shows the percentages of clinical trial participants, and the red bar shows the percentages of patients newly diagnosed as lung cancer. And let's see the subgroup, uh, subgroup of over age 75 age. Lung cancer patients account for 73, uh, 37%, but only 9% in clinical trial. Thus, the Clinical benefit of immune checkpoint inhibitors in elderly patients has not been well investigated in clinical trials. Therefore, we use National Cancer Database for stage four non-small cell lung cancer under and over 75 years of age between 2014 and 2015. In each group under and over 75 years old, overall survivor of patients who received amino checkpoint inhibitors and those who did not were compared according to age groups. This study included about 86,000 patients' data. This is one of the main results of this, of this study. In this univariate analysis, stage for non small cell lung cancer patients under 75 years of age. Patients who received amino checkpoint inhibitors had a significantly longer overall survival than those who did not. The hazard ratio was 0.67, and the median overall survival of patients who received amino checkpoint inhibitors was 14.5 months. The median survival of patients who did not receive amino checkpoint inhibitor was 7.8 months. Survival benefit from amino checkpoint inhibitors in patients under 75 years old is calculated as 14.5 minus 7.8 equals 6.7 months. In patients over 75 years old, similarly, 
patient who received immunotrick-point inhibitors had a significantly longer overall survival than the other patients. And the hazard ratio was 0 0.61. Median overall survival of patients who received immunotrick-point inhibitors was 11.9 months. And survival of patients who did not receive immunotrick-point inhibitors was 5.4 months. Survival benefit of immunotrick-point inhibitors in patients over 75 years old age was 6.5 months. That the survival benefit were equivalent between younger and elderly patients. But we have to be careful about the biases arising from the retrospective studies. This slide shows multivariate analysis of overall survival. Due to the limited space, I did not show the patient characteristics data, but patients who received amino checkpoint inhibitors was significantly associated with sex, histology, or distant metastasis, including these co potential confounding factors. We conducted much varied analysis of survival. And due to the limited space, I only showed the main result of the much varied analysis. The hazard ratio in patients under 75 years old without immune checkpoint inhibitor was 1.47. The corresponding hazard ratio in patients over 75 years old was 1.63. This hazard ratio in elderly patients was even larger than that of in younger patients. This means that clinical impact of immune checkpoint inhibitors in elderly patients may be even greater than that in younger patients. Let's see the data in clinical trials. This is a pooled analysis of Keynote 010 and 024 and 042 trials. And the blue curve shows survival of patients who receive pembrolizumab monotherapy. And the red curve shows the survival of patients who did not receive pembrolizumab therapy. The distance between the curve means that survival benefit from immune checkpoint inhibitors. And no significant difference in immune checkpoint inhibitor efficacy was observed between patients over 75 years of age and those under 75 years of age. In conclusion, age does not appear to negatively impact on survival benefit from immune checkpoint inhibitors in stage four non small cell lung cancer. Elderly patients with stage four non small cell lung cancer may be good candidates for immune checkpoint inhibitors. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Takamori. That was a great presentation, and your results certainly support the, the, the previous um, description from the keynote trials. The, Hopefully, we'll talk about it and hopefully the, the press will appreciate that this really just represents the tip of the iceberg, this data from 2014 to 2015, and now we have much more widespread use of these drugs. So we'll be interested to get your thoughts on, on how to apply them clinically, the implementation phase that Dr. Field had mentioned. Um, before we get to the questions, um, it's really my privilege to introduce Dr. Paul Wheatley Price. As all of you know, the ISLC really puts um, a significant amount of importance on the patient advocacy advocacy perspective on all of the science that's presented. Um, Dr. Wheatley Price is an associate professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Ottawa and a medical oncologist and lung cancer disease site lead at the Ottawa Hospital Cancer Center. And he specializes in the treatment of thoracic malignancies and carcinoma of unknown primary. Like many of us, uh, Dr. Uh, Wheatley Price is also a strong advocate for this disease that he treats. Um, he served as the president of the Lung Cancer Canada from 2016 to 2021, and has recently been appointed to the ASLC Patient Advocacy Committee. Dr. Wheatley Price will provide some comments on the discussed science through a patient advocate lens, and we're very much looking forward to hearing his comments. Great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the invitation to be part of this press conference and um, to uh, the, the authors for, for making their slides available to me um, a while ago. Um, so um, as you've heard, I'm a physician, I'm, I'm not a patient, and some of the press conferences that you'll have attended, you know, have patients as patient advocates, which is, um, you know, maybe gives a, uh, 
you know, maybe a more relevant lens. So, I'll, but I'll, I'll do my best uh, as somebody who's worked with patient groups for a number of years, um, and maybe reflect a little bit on on what patients ask us as a, as as advocacy groups uh, as as to what their needs are, in addition to what we hear from patients, obviously, in the clinic. Um, and as I kind of reflected on these three topics. Um, the elderly screening and circulating tumor DNA. I was trying to think. Well, is there is there a theme here um, in terms of supporting our patients? And I, I think the theme is is access to these uh, technologies, these, these treatments, these tests. Um, and um, you know, I, I was just looking for some pictogram to to uh, to help with this. And actually, this image um, is quite widely used on on the web of um, there's a difference between equality where you just give everyone the same thing but it ne doesn't necessarily reflect their needs uh, to equity which is uh, allowing everybody um, you know access to a treatment which might mean more of a, a helping hand for, for some rather than others and of course we have to battle with reality in society where you know the danger is that the rich get richer and everyone else gets left behind um, so we're just going through these in, in, um, in uh, one by one in the order that were presented. So uh, Professor Field talked about the UK lung screening trial with the reduction in lung cancer mortality. Um, and so a few thoughts. So, you know, strictly speaking, this wasn't a positive study, was it? And But I think Professor Field was quite open at the beginning of his presentation that the study wasn't powered to show a reduction in lung cancer mortality. Uh, which is why they went ahead and did the meta-analysis. Um, but the results are, are so in keeping with the meta-analysis results and the no national lung screening trial, uh, the Nelson study, we've seen it in, 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 in the country I now live in, in Canada, the pan-Canadian study. These, these studies are very consistent. We don't need any more evidence, I don't think, uh, that low-dose lung cancer screening is effective. And We've also heard, you know, throughout the meeting and in these presentations that lung cancer incidence is really high. And so we can talk about, you know, immunotherapy and circulating tumor DNA, which are really nice technologies. But ultimately, if we want to save patient lives, we have to identify people at an earlier stage. So low dose screening has this potential to be the single most important um, uh, intervention uh, that, that will save lives. So what we've now got to do is move to these issues of how do we implement lung cancer screening and how do we make it equitable? And these are challenges that are faced, I, I think, globally. Um, and you know, there were some interesting um, presentations earlier in the meeting that I'll just touch on, but it was heartening that, to hear in Professor Field's presentation that you know, they recognize this and that moving on from uh, um, the knowledge that we have to do lung cancer screening is how do you implement it so it reaches the people that need it. If you were in the opening plenary back on, uh, gosh, it's a long conference this year. Uh, was it Wednesday or Thursday? Um, the uh, Dr. Ray, uh, um, as he was referred to, um, gave this great presentation about disparities in lung cancer. This is in the US. And this slide particularly resonated with me on the left. Um, the states in black are those with the highest instance of, uh, of lung cancer per capita. Um, but on the right is the sort of density of, of screening facilities. Now, I recognize that, you know, there's, there are, there are uh, population densities which, which may uh, impact this. But it does seem to be a little stark that there is a disparity between where an impact is needed and, and where it's being directed. And then maybe even more starkly in, this, in the subsequent presentation in that session, Dr. Ajay talked about lung cancer more globally. And you know, we often think that about half of our cases, uh, at least in Canada, it's, it's about just under 50% um, of patients are diagnosed at stage four, uh, very much in line with what you're seeing here, USA and UK. But as we look through other countries, you see that proportion goes higher and higher which you could argue mean that the need for screening and, and early detection becomes, becomes more and more. Unless you think that I'm just sort of pointing the blame or, or the issue in other countries. In Canada, we for, sh for sure have this issue. And an, there was an important uh, document produced by the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer last year on lung cancer inequity, 
which identified that people who live in rural areas, people with lower socioeconomic groups, and various indigenous populations in Canada have poor access and poor outcomes. So when we're thinking about lung cancer screening and maybe in, indeed uh, about some of the other issues, uh, I think it's gonna be implementation and equity that we need to be looking at rather than more evidence that screening is, um, is important. W one final thing that I'd just say about lung cancer screening is um, at Lung Cancer Canada, when we, when we have a number of events, uh, patient events and, and educational events, and we talk about screening, and it's been our number one advocacy ask in Canada for a number of years, a lot of people in our, in, in our meetings put their hand up and say, well, what about me? Because they wouldn't have been eligible for lung cancer screening. So non-smokers, the EGFR positive patients who would not have met, met the criteria, and they do ask, well, what, well, what about me? I've got stage four lung cancer, and I wouldn't have been able to get a low dose scan. So maybe one final point is just to recognize that there is a nice amount of research out there uh, to, trying to expand screening with less interventional um, uh, tests. So, so uh, you know, are there, are there initial blood tests or, or breathomics, you know, analyzing exhaled breath that can sort of triage people towards screening. Uh, the second presentation uh, from uh, Dr. Romero, looking at uh, circulating tumor DNA, uh, was was really interesting and um, so for, from a patient angle I think you know we, we, we know that um, you know at early stage surgery is still the gold standard a lot of patients even at advanced stage you know they ask us well why can't I have an operation but but at least at early stage surgery is the gold standard um, and then additional adjuvant therapy after surgery or neoadjuvant therapy before surgery um, can eradicate Micrometastatic disease and improve these cure rates. And we've been, uh, you know, offering adjuvant chemotherapy for, for many years. Maybe about to start with some some immunotherapy and targeted therapies based on presentations over the last year or so. Neoadjuvant therapy, I guess, which was the the topic of of, of the study, the Nadim study, um, uh, at least in Canada, seems to be very dependent on the center. And I think patients sometimes confused about why in in, in one city they might be offered treatment after surgery and an, another cancer center might offer things before, but it's certainly been of more interest more recently the, the neoadjuvant approach. And when patients, I think, you know, look at new treatments and new technologies, um, you know, these are the kind of questions, you know, can, can a test help somebody avoid treatment if it's not gonna be helpful or if it's not needed because you can identify their prognosis is really good or on the flip side, uh, somebody who um, on the face of it might have a good prognosis, but with a bit of a, a new technology you might think, well, actually the prognosis is a bit, a bit poorer and, and additional therapy might be beneficial. And either way, patients want to know that the treatment they're gonna receive has got a chance of helping them. So even if there's a high risk, you know, only give me a treatment if it's going to reduce that risk. And historically, these technologies that we've used as a clinician to make these decisions and advise our patients is, is really the stage based on scans and, and the pathology from the pathologist report. Um, and so these newer technologies like circulating tumor DNA um, really become very attractive. Um, and, I, and I don't want to get into too much about the specific presentation of Dr. Romero. You know, it was quite a small study some of the other prognostic markers that we would seem to expect to work didn't seem to work so well. Um, and it would nice, be nice to see the later on results of whether the circulating tumor DNA changes over time with the subsequent blood draws. But I think what really the, the broader message or the bigger picture that I took from this presentation was um, sort of a glimpse into the future that um, that circulating tumor DNA, very attractive test for patients. It's a simple blood test. We're already doing it to identify driver mutations. And, and how effective is it now going to be to give prognostic information and, and then ultimately guide treatment decisions for patients so they can come to their oncologist, have a blood test, and, and, and then be reassured that their prognosis is really good or, or that actually they should go ahead with more treatment. And a lot of presentations at this conference uh, just on that, in fact, a couple of sessions just dedicated to, to liquid biopsies and circulating tumor DNA. Um, and I, I'm not going to go through these ones, but this was a really good session from a couple of days ago 
uh, that it might be worth um, having a look at if you're interested in a bit more of this. And then um, uh, last but not least, uh, Dr. Takamori uh, presented um, the results of, of looking at immunotherapy in an elderly population over 75 years of age. And, you know, we know depending on where you live in the world, um, the median age of lung cancer um, does vary a little bit, but it's, it's generally in the, the, you know, higher 60s, early 70s. And so if you take a cutoff of 75, or, or some people will take 70 as a cutoff, uh, you know, it's a major issue um, for, for the most commonly diagnosed cancer, that this is, you know, hundreds of thousands of people uh, that are in this, these elderly groups, and we need to be able to guide them, and, and, and patients need to have the confidence from their oncologist um, in the elderly populations that there are effective treatments for them. And I wonder if some of that is really um, um, having the confidence that uh, the physicians do have a good understanding of health issues in the elderly, aside from just the lung cancer specifics, um, because we do know as, you know, as we get older, um, we may be more frail. Uh, there's, there's other medical issues that come to mind, maybe cognitive issues for some people, fewer social supports. Um, or, so people can be, not always, but can be certainly more vulnerable, uh, and therefore giving a safe treatment is really important. And geriatric oncology is becoming this, this broader branch of oncology, which is really, uh, I think, very patchy where it's offered now, but to be it for, for patients to have the confidence that they are being seen in the whole, not just their lung cancer, but all of their comorbidities and and social determinants of health become, become crucial. And we've known for a few years that chemotherapy can, can generally be safely administered to, to fit elderly patients. But if you, for those who are in what we call the older old, I guess, or the uh, over 80, you know, there are, there are higher risks of adverse events. Um, so, so identifying these safe treatments becomes really important. Um, and, and so I really appreciated um, that IASLC has highlighted this um, abstract to, to bring to the press conference uh, to, to, to really highlight this issue. Um, I think there are some questions about the study itself. The, the data is taken from 2014-15 and, and those earliest presentations that immunotherapy was effective were really only coming out around that time. So presumably a lot of these patients would have been in those sort of earlier evidence phase of immunotherapy in the second line setting most commonly. Uh, where there's a bit of a selection bias here, a selection pressure that these are all elderly patients who are well enough to have had first line treatment and then still well enough maybe to have subsequent treatments. And we know there's this drop off. And, and even in actually the, the trials that, that um, were referenced at the end, you know, those are also patients who are well enough to get into a, a trial. So there's some selection pressures. But despite that, it's encouraging, isn't it, that immunotherapy looks really good in the elderly. Um, and there's a, I just put in a, a reference if people are interested, a, a real world evidence analysis of immunotherapy in different age groups, which would seem to support the, the results that we've just heard uh, that immunotherapy is safe. And, and, and so, you know, for patients and clinicians and family members and for, for our community, isn't it encouraging now that, that we're at an era where we have more options for our elderly patients? That we can give you know safely and with confidence with immunotherapies and targeted therapies and i think that is all i have so thank you very much and um i, I suspect the questions are going to be for for the for the authors but um i'll, I'll stay online as well if, if people have any questions for me well thank you dr wheelie price and i suspect that you'll have a lot of good perspective on a lot of the questions as well and we have about 15 minutes and i hope we get time for each i'm going to go through some of the questions that were put in the chat and um, I'd like to hear the different perspective. I'm going to start with Professor Field and some of the screening questions. Um, you know, uh, Ed Sussman from MedPage today had asked me to expand on comments about the significance of the screening trials and are there still controversies regarding the benefit and cost effectiveness? I think that there are, and I think that that's why we're still seeing these studies and doing these studies. 
And in particular, he asked um, Dr. Field, should we be concerned that the difference was not statistically significant versus the overall meta-analysis that we should take to the bank? And that was echoed by Caroline Hellwood from ASCO Post, who said, hey, you look, this isn't statistically significant. Um, you show differences in stage of diagnosis and overall mortality, but not lung cancer mortality. You know, what is the right endpoint in screening trials? Can you, uh, Dr. Phil, can you talk about some of the practicalities of it and uh, how we should think about these data compared to the overall meta-analysis? Well, well, thanks to Caroline for her question. It's both interesting and provocative. Um, I think the point I made is that uh, the UKLS pilot was not actually designed to provide mortality data. Uh, we just didn't have the funding to run the full trial. So, I mean, the RR value was 0 0.65, which you could say is a very good figure, but when you look at the confidence, it's 0 0.0, it's 0 0.41 to 1.02. So you could say it's just outside. However, it's not significant. And, and it's for that very reason that we actually looked at a meta-analysis. And there's only one European study that actually is powered, and that's the Nelson. And the question has to be asked, do you just put all the weight behind the NLST and the Nelson, or do you use data that comes from other trials? And they, I mean, you, you can look at the data and you can see that they're all weighted, but the, uh, all of the other trials, which are all around the 4,000 mark within uh, Europe, are contributing to the meta-analysis. And uh, some contribute more than others, and you can see that um, there are different type of trials. So that figure that came out at 16% is very conservative at the lower end. Where do you actually statistically draw the line? Uh, I mean, ideally have enough funding like the uh, NLST and you know, probably the most expensive trial ever run in lung cancer and, and you know, a much larger trial even run in, in the Netherlands and Belgium. So you used what you have. Uh, and, um, and I think the thing is we, got to the point now that in, we have sufficient data, in my mind, to move forward. Now, I think each country in Europe, I know in, in the United States, a decision has been made to implement, but no country in Europe has actually implemented. In the UK, I must say, we have bounced forward. Uh, I was very pleased that um, certainly in Liverpool, the clinicians and public health liked the results from the UKLS, didn't want to sit on their hands, and they started the Liverpool Healthy Lung Project implementation study, followed by Manchester, followed by London, followed by Yorkshire, and now we have this very large NHS England targeted lung health check, which will be larger than any other study. And I think this, the, the question now is not so much, is there a mortality difference? I think the question is, can we demonstrate cost effectiveness? And that, in my mind, is going to be the decision point in the UK. We have a very different healthcare system than the US, and what is considered cost effective in the US is very different from uh, England. But I actually believe that we will find it cost effective, and again, it depends what you put in the cost effectiveness model, but if you put in lung cancer mortality and smoking cessation, I believe we will find it cost effective. I hope for that helps Caroline uh, with her uh, question. Professor Field, let me point out one thing too. I, I think one of the most interesting things to me is the single screen design and you call it the walled single screen design. As you talk about cost effectiveness, as you talk about realizing a mortality benefit in the US, we're constantly trying to get patients back for their follow-up screen and pointing out how important that is for the mortality benefit. H how do you see the implementation? Is a single screen enough? Um, should this be done annually? What, uh, this is a really, really important point that I think has a lot of implications for lung cancer screening. Do, do you have any thoughts on that? I think as a clinical trial, the single wall, one screen design was in my mind, excellent. And if anybody knows Professor Wall, it was an excellent idea and he's used it in other cancers as well. However, if and when we move into lung cancer screening, we initially would consider yearly. But in fact, if you look at the Nelson data, I believe we can actually use the baseline and maybe the first screen to identify patient's risk and thereby possibly only undertake a screening every two years. Now, naturally one will have to look at other risk factors. Now, 
I, I mentioned twice within my presentation, we use the LLP risk model. And there are two very good international risk models, the PLCO and the LLP. And in fact, we are using both in the targeted lung health check in the UK. So we would have to keep an eye on if they develop respiratory diseases, if they family history, et cetera. But I do believe that in fact, um, and hopefully this is answering your question. I do believe that we won't be looking at a one screen design. We will be looking at yearly. And then during that lifetime, I mean, we're looking at 20 years, there will be periods where one will only have to undertake the screen maybe every two years. That's a great response. And I think that really leads in well to some of the next questions. And, and you know, the idea about getting to primary care physicians and making it easy for them, we're, we're sort of talking to the choir or preaching to, to each other here about this, and we all understand these benefits. Um, maybe uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Wheatley Price, what do you thinks about political pressure? Certainly, I think the endorsement by the American Academy of Family Physicians in the US should, should help with some of this, but is it the carrot or the stick? How do we get primary care physicians to increase screening? Well, I think there's a few issues around this, and and you know one of them, which I hate to bring up, but we seem to all the time about lung cancer is stigma, um, and there is still stigma around lung cancer. And you can imagine that this, if this was um, a breast cancer issue, we we wouldn't be having an implementation discussion. Um, and yet, um, from my understanding, that the, the number of people you need to screen in lung cancer to save a life is fewer than the number of women that would need a mammogram to save a breast cancer life. And yet we're not having that, we're not having that discussion. So whether there's some sort of political pressure which, which brings in stigma uh, as, um, a, as a point, I think would be helpful. Um, the, the other issues around cost effectiveness, it is, I guess it's, it's complicated. I believe there are some studies now which, which do show us cost effectiveness of lung cancer screening but it, it depends a bit on the jurisdiction and, and how healthcare is delivered. Education, of course, is gonna be the key. And at, and at Lung Cancer Canada, we're working with the, uh, the Royal College of Family Physicians here in Canada and the different provinces to try and develop educational programs. So for the family physicians and there's groups that come in and say, well, let's do a one day seminar. And they think, no, 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 no. Family doctors won't come to a one day seminar on lung cancer screening. Let, let's, how about a 15 minute program just to show them, you know, where to refer and who they need to refer. And, and family docs are good at this, aren't they? they they're good at colorectal cancer screening, perhaps, perhaps mirrors, uh, mammogram. It, they're good at this. We just need to educate them. So I think there's, there's, there's a lot that's going on. We're sort of at the tipping point in, in, in some of our countries where it's kind of coming and we just got to push it on. Um, but then we're gonna have to address uh, um, you know, countries where the rates of lung cancer are higher uh, and maybe don't have the resources. I totally agree. And I think there's a critical role for ISLAC and all the other lung cancer foundations out there to get, get this out there, but as well as by our professional societies. And I, I expect that we'll continue to see more pressure as you suggest. Um, I'm gonna move to the third presentation now, Dr. Takamori, there were, were several questions um, about your presentation. And Dr. Romero, I do wanna get back with a couple of questions about yours as well. Um, you know, one, one question about was, um, uh, from Brian Hoyle at Practice Update about, you know, is more research needed or can we put this into clinical practice now? One was from Kara Adler at the NAGM group, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine group about you know, treatment related adverse events. And I think this all gets to that question. We've seen a couple studies in selected patients. Your study is arguably earlier where a lot of patients get in these drugs may have been pretty carefully selected as well too. How do we think about the practical implications of giving immune checkpoint inhibitors to elderly patients? Are there situations perhaps where, where it's too risky and where the benefit is low or should this be an across the board that it's offered to all patients? This has tremendous implications as outlined by Dr. Wheatley Price and any of the others can weigh in on this question as well. Dr. Takamori, what do you think? Yes, um, I think that uh... Uh, this data included patients who received uh, immunotherapy point inhibitor monotherapy, uh, given that uh, pembrolizumab monotherapy was approved by FDA in 2016. But nowadays, um, after 2018, the combination therapy of immunotherapy and uh, immunocheckpoint inhibitors has uh, also been uh, approved by FDA. And uh, this is a new treatment options. Uh, 
for uh, not only for younger patients but also elderly patients. Therefore, um, I think we have to be careful you know, when we apply this data to the clinical practice, uh, given the combination therapy is approved. Um, some subgroup analysis of elderly patients from the clinical trials um, investigating combination therapy of immunotherapy and the chemotherapy uh, showed that uh, combination therapy is more beneficial to younger patients compared with elderly patients. So I think the further study is very important to investigate which of immunotherapy, uh, monotherapy, or combination therapy is really appropriate for elderly lung cancer patients. And in addition to that, um, the biomarkers for selecting patient, uh, elderly patients who will benefit from immuno checkpoint inhibitors is very important. Um, as you know, um, elderly patients may have decreased skeletal muscle area. And for example, I the status of having decreased skeletal muscle is called sarcopenia. And previous to the uh, report, previous reports, including ours, sarcopenia is an independent uh, worst prognostic factor in lung cancer patients receiving immunotherapy. And that would also be a confounding factors of elderly patients. Um, Thus, the further advanced research is important to find the biomarker for the efficacy of immuno checkpoint inhibitors. And now we are con con conducting a prospective observational study of nutritional and immunologic indices as a pre predictive biomarker in lung cancer patients who receive immuno checkpoint inhibitors. And the clinical trials is now ongoing, and maybe we may uh, be able to show the biomarkers for elderly patients. I hope so. Well, those are great points, and there's ongoing efforts by many in the patient advocacy advocacy community to expand trials, right? And so why do we have just an arbitrary cutoff of age? And I think from the, the patient voice and the patient perspective, we should see more uh, widespread enrollment of patients into trials so we can really study these things prospectively. Um, Dr. Romero, I wanted to ask you one question. Um, you know, I, I think that the press and everybody understand just how important this concept is of just, you know, go to the doctor and take a blood-based test, right, and see what that's going to going to tell you. It's appealing to patients. It's appealing scientifically, particularly in the early stage setting where we're trying to decide whether to launch a patient on the pathway of some of these sometimes expensive therapies. Um, you know, one could argue about predictors of response to immunotherapy, things like pdl one and TMB may be apparent, um, but predictors of survival. You know, is, is circulating DNA more a predictor of a survival or is it a predictor of response to immunotherapy? And how should we think about that as we move forward with these ever more complex neoadjuvant and adjuvant trials? Uh, uh, is that question for me? For Dr. Uh, Romero. Ah, okay, thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you very much for your for your question. And uh, so I think the circulation tumor DNA analysis has both. Uh, it can inform about the uh, um, pronostic of the patient. So and um, many others have also claimed that um, circulating tumor DNA levels in, before treatment. Uh, could be included in the staging system or a modified staging system, including um, amounts of circulating tumor DNA, but also fluctuations about uh, circulating tumor DNA. And this data is going to be presented also by Dr. Provencio, also inform about uh, response. And our data also, although the, the numbers that we have are small, uh, what we see is that circulating tumor DNA clearance clearly uh, identifies the patients that uh, uh, respond to treatment and even more accurate than, uh, and, uh, than um, radiological uh, criteria, radiological um, response according to resist criteria. So I think that circulating tumor DNA clearly uh, is informative in this way and should be uh, both. Uh, Consider as a trial endpoint, as a for, for, because it uh, really predicts long-term survival, and also uh, it can inform uh, oncologists and may be useful to tailor subsequent therapies in non-small cell lung cancer patients. Uh, so yeah. 
Thanks, that's great. And can I ask you to clarify one point? Did it predict um, major or complete pathologic response or just survival? Did you look at that as well? Yeah, we do uh, look at that. So um, uh, during the being clinical trial, uh, the development of the trial was, uh, unfortunately, we had this uh, pandemic. Uh, so uh, we had two patients dying from COVID-19. So when excluding these two patients uh, for the biomarker analysis, because these patients that died from COVID-19, they, they didn't uh, have uh, they didn't have any progression disease, or and they will uh, from a clinical point of view, they weren't on progression. Uh, so um, if we do not exclude this patient from COVID-19, only ctDNA was predicted for long-term survival. Uh, if we exclude these patients from the trial. From, uh, from the biomarker analysis, uh, pathological response, complete pathological response and ctDNA are both predicted, but not major pathological response. So only complete pathological response. If we do the analysis with major, you know, uh, it's not predicted. And we, yeah, we decide to exclude these two patients because they uh, disease, but the, the, the reason for this was that we were in a, a situation with this pandemic, uh, COVID-19 and sure. it might be a confounding factor. I guess the other thing I was asking that I didn't quite get it was does circulating DNA predict pathologic response? Not survival, not does pathologic response predict survival, but does free circulating DNA predict pathologic response? Yes, there is an association between circulating tumor DNA clearance and pathologic and complete pathological response. Not clearance, but does the presence preoperatively predict pathologic response? Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, yes, there is an association yes. between pretreatment and circulating tumor DNA and complete pathological response. Super, thank you. Um, I don't see any other particular questions unless there were any pending in there. I'm gonna encourage um, any of the press to reach out directly if you um, put these in the chat or email Joy or us, we can get questions directly to the authors for any of you. Um, any any other questions or, or pertinent things that, that anybody wants to talk about? I don't see anything else new in the chat, um, particularly uh, specifics about some of the studies I think can maybe be best addressed with the authors who can get back uh, very uh, sort of pertinent written responses to the press. Well, that's everything. I'd love to thank everybody. Um, really the broad spectrum of lung cancer, and that's I think what we do at, at ISLC. And so thanks everyone for participating. Um, lots going on in screening, um, treatment lo of locally advanced disease and treatment for advanced patients. We just have to make sure that we get all these things to all the patients. So thanks so much for taking the time to listen in.